Hi, this is Pastor Mark Wright of Evers Road Christian Church, and this is the pre-recorded message sermon for Sunday, May 22nd. And this pre-recording is especially for those of you of our Evers Road friends and family who, for whatever reason, are unable to attend in person. We want you to know we miss you and we love you, and we look forward to the day when you can be again with us again. And we pray for your needs, whatever they are. The reason you're not able to be with us, whether you're traveling or whether you have some health uh, issue, we're praying for you. Uh, we are on the series of grace. This is the second installment in a series on God's amazing grace. That is our theme, God's amazing grace. And we're asking the question, what is so amazing about God's grace. And last week, based on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we saw that God's grace is amazing because God, we are saved by God's grace. We are saved. You are saved by God's grace. And that is why His grace is so amazing. And today we're going to be looking at the book of Romans. And the theme that I want to focus on is that God's grace is amazing because it's through grace that God sets us free. So last week, saved by grace. This week, set free by grace. Now I want to start in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, because this is a verse which helps, helps us clear up our understanding of grace. It helps us uh, set the stage for a definition of grace. Last, year, last week, we talked about grace as unmerited favor unmerited favor and it's not by works well Romans chapter 11 verse 6 is so clear and emphatic it says and if by grace then it cannot be based on works for if it were grace would no longer be gr grace so we see here that grace and works are direct opposites Grace is the antithesis of works, according to the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. If you are working for it to earn it, then you're not receiving it by grace. If you're receiving it freely as a gift and you did not earn it, you did not merit it, you did not uh, deserve it, then it is by grace. Okay, so with that said, let's go to Romans chapter 3. And we're going to see verse 20. And one of the themes that comes up over and over in Romans, in, in connection to grace, is law, the word law. Paul uses the word law in Romans many, many times, and most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, when Paul says law, he is referring to the law of the Old Testament, the law given by Moses, the Ten Commandments and all of the other commandments given through the prophet Moses, the law. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, he says something definitive about the law. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of our sin. So he makes two statements here. First of all, no one will be declared righteous or no one will be justified before God by the works of the law. Now, don't think that you can do God's law, you can obey God's law perfectly all of your life, and you can somehow, by the works of the law, by obedience to God, obedience to the Old Testament commandments, you can thereby earn your salvation. That is false, that is a lie, and Paul says it right here very emphatically. No one, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. And in Galatians 2.16, it's a parallel passage. Paul says it twice there. No flesh will be justified by the law. So get that out of your mind. That cannot happen. That was not even the purpose of the law. And he tells us what the purpose of the law is in the next part. He says, rather, through the law, we became conscious of our sin. And that was the purpose of the law, to delineate the difference between sin and righteousness. The law was to draw a line in the ground and say, this is sin and this is not. And the law accomplished that purpose. And the law pointed out to us what was sinful and what was not. Now, I want to make it very clear that the law in itself, Paul says, was good and righteous and holy. The flaw, the problem, was not with God's law. The problem was with man's corrupt sinfulness. 
Now, even before Moses came down off the mountain, Mount Sinai, with the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone, even before he got to the bottom of the mountain, he discovered that God's people had broken at least two of those commandments uh, to worship false gods and, and to commit adultery. And so Moses threw the stones, and they, the, the tablets of stones broke. And it was symbolic of how God's law was perfect. God's law was good and holy and righteous. But man was sinful and therefore in, incapable of keeping God's law. But through the law, the law did its job. God's word accomplished the purpose for which he sent it because the law convicted us of our sinfulness. The law set the holy, perfect standard. And when we sin, we violate that standard. We fall short of that standard. We disobey that standard, and we end up condemned. Through the law, become, we become conscious of our sin. Now, there's another verse in Romans chapter 7 where Paul says it. If the law had not said, Thou shalt not covet, I would not have known about coveting. But when the law said, Do not covet, I coveted in every way. And that's the way we are. It's like the child, the two-year-old child. You say to that child, Don't touch the cake. And you turn your back, and what's the child probably going to do? The probably is going to touch the cake. You're probably going to turn around, and that child will have a cho chocolate icing all over his fingers because he touched the cake after you told him not to. And that's sadly the way our human nature is. We're wired that way to defy authority, to disobey, to violate law. When God gave a law, it's a perfect law, it's a good law, it's a holy law, but man fell short because of a sinful, corrupt nature. But in the process, man became conscious of his sin. Now, it's been said by many that you can't understand grace until you first try and justify yourself by the law. When you try and justify yourself by the law and fail, that's when you realize, I can't do this. I give up. I'm lost. I'm doomed. There's no way I can ever be saved. When you get to that point where you realize that you cannot save yourself by your own righteousness, by your own good works, when you come to that point, that is when you can receive God's grace. You see, God's grace is offensive to the self-righteous. And that's what the law was to do. The law was to destroy our self-righteousness. If you truly read the law and you realize I broke it, I've disobeyed it, I've violated it, I've transgressed the law, I stand guilty, that destroys your self-righteousness. And that was the purpose of God's law. So it wasn't that the law failed. No, no. God's purpose was never to save us by the law. The law did not fail. The law actually accomplished the very thing God had in mind, and that was to convict us of our sin and to show us that we are sinners. Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, I had a dear loved one who mistakenly said to me, God made a mistake when he gave us the law because he realized afterward that we couldn't be saved by the law, and God corrected his mistake by giving us grace. False! That is false. That is not true. God did not make a mistake. It's, you can't teach a child advanced math, like this, advanced forms of algebra, without first teaching him basic math. You have to take the prerequisites to understand the more advanced subjects. Grace was a more advanced subject. And you had to get rid of your own self-righteousness to understand grace. And law was God's tool to show us that we are sinners and that we need grace. And the only way we can ever be saved is through grace. So having said that, just a couple of verses later in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul, after saying there's no difference between Jew and Greek, even though the Jews have the law, there's no difference. They've violated that law. They've sinned against that law. Therefore, there's no difference when it comes to righteousness, we're all sinners, and he says that in verse 23, for all, and all refers to both Jews and Greeks, and all people, all individuals, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So sin, sin, you cannot understand God's grace without understanding that you're a sinner and that you deserve condemnation. You must understand the biblical doctrine of sin before you can understand the biblical doctrine of grace. The biblical doctrine of sin is that you are a sinner and you are guilty and you deserve condemnation and you deserve punishment. Now again, that's offensive to the self-righteous, but that's what the Bible teaches. All have sinned and fall short 
of the glory of God. Now, understanding that, understanding you can't do it by works, you can't do it by the law, and you are a sinner, and you deserve condemnation and death, that prepares you, that puts you in a position to understand grace, and grace comes in the very next verse. We just read Romans 3.23, all have sinned. Romans 3.24 says, and all are justified freely through, by his grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Then verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Now, I want to pause right here and say that uh, Paul's actually taken us on a little tour, a tour of different geographic locations in the ancient world, a tour of three different landmarks by the language he's using. First, he says, justified. Well, there he's taken us on a tour of the tribunal, the courthouse, because justified is a legal term, and it means to be declared innocent, to be proven innocent in a court of law. And then the next term he uses is redemption. And using the word redemption, he takes us on a tour of the slave market, which could be found also in Rome, because their slaves were, were sold uh, into bondage, sold into servant, uh, servant to, to be servants. But if a family member came and saw his own loved one, his own brother or sister or cousin, at auction being sold as a slave, that family member could redeem his loved one. Now, redemption means to pay a price, to buy back, and set free. So redemption doesn't mean I'm going to buy you to make you to my slave. No, redemption means you once belonged to me, or there was some relationship through which we belonged to each other. I lost you. Now I'm going to pay a price to buy you back. And I'm going to set you free. That's the meaning of redemption. And you can redeem a loved one in the market, in the slave market, if you got there on time before they were sold and to someone else. But you would have to pay a very costly price to do it. Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid the price. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. And that was the price paid for your redemption. Now, you once belonged to God because God created you. But even though you once belonged to God, you went astray. You became alienated from God. You, you became estranged from God. And you became far off from God. So he bought you back. He bought you back. He paid the price, the blood of his son, Jesus, on the cross to set you free. And he sets us free from sin. Then in verse 25, Paul takes us on a tour there of the third landmark, which is the Hebrew temple. When, when Paul writes, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. This depicts the day of atonement in the Old Testament. In, in the books of Moses, where once a year, the high priest, and only the high priest, no one on the face of the earth except for the high priest, went into the, not the holy place, but the holy of holies, the most holy place. Only the high priest could go in there. And he can only go in there one time a year. And he had to take blood. And when he took the blood of the sacrifices into the holy of holies one time a year, had to be the high priest, not a priest, but the high priest, a descendant of Aaron, according to the law of Moses. When he went in there one time a year with the blood of the sacrifices, he sprinkled it on the mercy seat, which was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And that was the atonement. Now, the, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament tells us that the blood of bulls and goats never takes away sin. Yes, it was commanded by God in the Old Testament, but it only rode sin forward and it depicted, it prophesied the blood of Jesus, which would take away all sin of all time. So Jesus' blood is the true sacrifice that takes away sin, the true atonement. And so when Paul says God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, he's taken us to the third landmarks. What are these landmarks? Landmark number one, the tribunal, because Paul said... All are justified freely by his grace. Landmark number two, the slave market, because Paul said, through the redemption that comes through, that came by Christ Jesus. And the third landmark is the Hebrew temple in Jerusalem, for, because Paul wrote, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Now, right in the middle of all of this is the phrase, freely by his grace. That's in verse 24. Freely by his grace. Now again, grace means unmerited favor. Grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace means it's not by works. If it were work by works, it wouldn't be grace. Freely by his grace. You are justified freely by his grace. And that's through the redemption. Jesus bought you back by paying the price on the cross. 
And the price that he paid was that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement to make expiation or propitiation for your sins. Well, that word propitiation or expiation or atonement, it also implies that the sacrifice appeases the wrath of God. Now, I know some have trouble with that. I'm aware of that. But the word wrath is in the Bible, and the Bible also teaches that God saves us from his wrath through his son's death on the cross, Romans 5, 9. All right. So here we come to grace. After understanding that you can't be saved by works, Romans chapter 11, verse 6. And after understanding that you cannot be saved by the works of the law, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. And after understanding that all are sinners, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we come to grace. You're justified by grace. That means you're declared innocent. You're declared righteous. Even though we weren't, God declares us righteous when we were guilty. He does that through the sacrifice of Jesus. And you're redeemed by his grace. God pays a price to set you free. He sets you free by paying a precious price and he buys you back. You once belonged to him, but you went astray, and he buys you back. That's redemption. He buys you back by paying a precious price, and he sets you free, free from the slavery of sin. And then God presents Jesus as a, Jesus Christ, his son, as a sacrifice of atonement, a propitiation, an expiation, to atone the wrath of God and take away sins. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 and that's through his grace all of this is through his grace so what we see in all of this is we receive something we did not deserve we receive something we could not earn we, we we're too poor to pay for it because it costs too much we receive something freely by his grace okay now i want to jump to romans chapter 5 verse 20 uh, it's not the next time grace is used in the New Testament. In fact, it's used three other times in Romans chapter 5. It's also used in Romans chapter 4. But I want to jump to this voice, this verse, Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Uh, one, because of limited time, and two, because this verse makes the point. This verse states something that really is astounding and, and again, offensive to the self-righteous. Okay, here we go. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Now, the, the first part of the verse, I can just see eyebrows raising. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. What does that mean? Well, again, Paul already uh, had, had explained that in Romans chapter 7 where he says, if the law had not said, thou shalt not covet, I wouldn't have coveted. But when the law said, thou shalt not covet, I started coveting of every kind of covetousness. Uh, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Now again, the problem, the flaw, is not with the law. The law was perfect. The law was holy. The law was good. It's God's in word, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the problem was with our corrupt, sinful nature, the flesh. Now just because we in our sinful nature are too corrupt to keep the law perfectly doesn't mean the law is flawed. Just the contrary. The law shows that we're flawed. We're sinful. And the effect of the law actually was to bring us the consciousness of sin but then what do we do as humans subject to this sinful nature? We sin all the more. We sin all the more. But then it says where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Whoa. Okay. And what that means is God's grace will always be greater than your sin. Did you hear what I said? God's grace is always greater than your sin. Now this does not give us a license to sin. That's not where Paul's going. He's going to address that in a minute. But just grasp this fact. God's grace is always greater than your sin. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. You remember who Ted Bundy is? Ted Bundy was a serial killer that assaulted and murdered at least 40 women, probably more, in a killing spree that started up in 
the Washington, Seattle, Washington, and went all the way across the country into Florida. And that's where he was finally put to death on death row in a prison in Florida. After he was tried and convicted and put on death row, James Dobson went to visit Ted Bundy in prison. And you can actually see the interviews. They're on YouTube. And after James Dobson talked to Ted Bundy and Ted Bundy responded to Dobson by receiving Jesus as his Savior and asking for forgiveness. James Dobson made a statement that he believed that he would see Ted Bundy in heaven. Now what? How could that be? How could a man who's such a terrible, terrible, terrible sinner who assaulted up to 40 women and murdered over probably more than 40 women, and some, some of them were very, very young. One was 12 years old, I believe. How could James, how could Ted Bundy be in heaven? Well, again, where sin increased, God's grace increased all the more. Now, I know that's offensive. That's offensive to the self-righteous. I worked hard for my salvation. I've lived a righteous life. And you're telling me that I can't get into heaven by my own good works, but that guy over there who's a murderer and a serial killer and a rapist, he can get into heaven because he confesses his sin and believes in Jesus? Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Now, here's the good news about that. If Ted Bundy can get into heaven, probably you can too. Probably I can too. And we're going to get into heaven the same way. We're all going to get into heaven the same way, and that's by the grace of Jesus, his unmerited favor. Okay, so now this brings us to really the, the primary theme and application this morning, and that is found in the question that Paul himself poses in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, just a few verses forward. We're set free. We're set free from the slavery of sin. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Now Paul is taking this absurd question right from the mouth of his critics. Because leave it to human nature. Evil humans will abuse the grace of God. Evil humans will say, hey, wait, look at this. If we can go on sinning and God's grace is always greater than our sin, why not keep sinning all the more? Why not enjoy all the pleasures of sin on this earth and all the while still be saved? False. False. Paul said, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Now he gives a twofold answer in Romans chapter 6. And Romans chapter 6 is the answer to this question. Now, we're not going to see every verse because of the limited amount of time we have, but we're going to see two key verses. Each key verse highlights one part of the twofold answer. And the very first verse is in verse 2. Verse 2. By no means we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? You know, those who are biblically illiterate and read a verse like this are puzzled. What does it mean, died to sin? Okay. It has everything to do with the new birth. And in the new birth, the man of sin dies and a new man is born again. But I want to pose it also this way. Dead people don't keep on sinning in the flesh the way they did when they were alive here on earth. When we are alive here on earth, Paul says in the same chapter of Romans chapter 6, too often we present the members of our body as instruments of sin. You can use your mouth as an instrument of sin. You can use your tongue to curse God. You can use your tongue to tell a lie. You can use your hands to steal. You can use your hands to do acts of violence. And we use the members of our body as instruments of sin. Well, dead people don't do that. Someone who dies no longer uses the, the members of their, the physical body as instruments of sin. Their, their struggle with sin is over. It's over. It's finished. And so there will come a time in the future when you stop sinning. The time hasn't come yet because Christians were, were still sinners, even though we're saved by grace, and we've been born again, and we have the Holy Spirit, and we've repented of our sin, and we're making an effort every day to turn away from sin, we still sin. So we haven't reached that point yet where we totally, totally, totally quit sinning. But what if we had the mindset that I know someday I'm going to die, and at that time, when I die physically, 
I will no longer use my hands and my tongue on the other members of my body. I'll no longer use them as instruments of sin. So why not just begin that right now? Why not just fast forward the VHS <laughs> and, and, and jump to that point right now as if I've already arrived, as if I were already dead and in the grave? Why not do away with sin right now? And so let me say this. Where Paul says we've died to sin, yes, it, it, it signifies the new birth by the Holy Spirit where we repent of our sins, we're born again, and the old sinful nature is put to death. Paul says that in Romans 6, 6. This is the very chapter. Romans 6, 6, our, the old man was crucified with Christ. But it also means a new mindset. A new mindset where I consider myself dead to sin. Someday I will die in the flesh, and I will no longer use my in, the instruments of my, the members of my body as instruments of sin. Why not begin that practice right here, right now, while I'm still physically alive? Why not sever the relationship with sin right here, right now? It's a commitment. It's repentance and a commitment to turn to God and do away with sin. Doesn't mean we don't struggle with sin. We still do. Because we're in this world and the world is filled with sinful temptation. We still have a battle, even though we have the Holy Spirit and we've been born again, we still have a battle with the residual power of our flesh. And Satan. Satan is in the world around us and he tempts us. So there's still a struggle with sin, but we have victory in our daily walk through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the difference. We've died to sin. So whenever you're tempted, just say to yourself, I've died. I've died to sin. And that's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is found in verse 14. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are under not under law, but under grace. So it's interesting. Notice the word grace. Notice the word master. Paul ties it all together with grace again. Being justified and saved by grace doesn't give you a license for sinning. Absolutely not. It does just the opposite. Being justified by grace, being saved by grace, means that you should no longer consider sin your master. But you should consider Jesus your master because through the power of God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, you have been set free from the slavery of sin. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, so in the new covenant, we're under grace. This doesn't mean that Paul's advocating lawlessness when he says you're not under law because he says in 1 Corinthians 9 that we're under the law of Christ. And he gave us the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus affirmed those commandments. So when he says not under law, he's not saying that Christians can engage in lawlessness. He's not saying that. But what he is saying in the new covenant with the power of the Holy Spirit as stated in Jeremiah, the laws of God are written in our heart and not on tab tablets of stone. The power of the Holy Spirit is giving us victory in our daily walk. Because we are under grace, that's the reason why sin should no longer be our master. Now I want you to notice the, the parallel between this verse, Romans 6 14 and, and a verse we already saw Romans 3 24 in Romans 3 24 it says justified freely by his grace through the redemption remember redemption means to be set free you could redeem a, a beloved one from the slave market and buy them back by paying a price and then you can set them free and that's what the word redemption means. It has three parts to its meaning. To buy back someone you once had a relationship with, to pay a precious price, and to set free. And Jesus sets us free. He redeems us. He once owned us because we are his creation. He bought us back. He paid the price, his blood, and he sets us free. And then compare that to Romans 6.14. For sin shall no longer be your master. You should no longer serve sin. You should no longer be a slave to sin. 
You should surrender your life to living for Jesus. Okay. So what's so amazing about grace? Grace. God's unmerited favor. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. It liberates us from the false tyranny of a theology of salvation by works. That's tyranny because you can never ever save yourself by works and you can never ever know that you've done enough. Grace, it illumines us and it exposes the false teachings of men, man-made religion, which says you can earn your own salvation. Grace, it emancipates us from the power and the control of sin. Grace, we are saved by grace and we are set free by grace. What's so amazing about grace? You are saved by grace, and you are set free by grace. This is Pastor Mark Wright of Evers Road Christian Church. God bless.